Uh, so we'll start out, actually, um, you spent all of yesterday kind of doing an intro waves lab simulation. Um, that's something I told you, I think, that we usually do in purpose, or in purpose, uh, in person. Um, so you actually get to hold that spring, you get to move it around. Uh, but you know, that was, I mean, it was decent. It was the closest that we could get. But basically, one of the things that we want to do is we want to answer this question right here. Um, whether this can happen. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. When oh, school isn't a place really? you have to be. It's a commercial. Why not go to school where remote? We'll turn the commercial off. We'll skip the ad. Here we go. Have you guys seen this movie? Oh, yeah, right I, I see some nodding. And then, oh, here's here's where I want. So, can that actually happen? What do you guys think? Any ideas? Think it's just made up movie stuff? Well, think about it, all right? Think about that while we're, um, while we're uh, talking today and keep thinking about it for the next few days. And remember you guys, uh, some of you don't have your cameras on, you can turn them on now, right? Uh, so Wave Basics. Basically, this is what a wave is, you guys. A wave is a way to transfer energy. So you uh, remember we talked there are two different types of energy that we really focused on. Um, well, actually, main, one main type, and that was mechanical energy. Although we also talked about thermal energy as well. And within mechanical energy, which is the moving of physical objects, we talked about potential and kinetic, right? Well... A wave is basically, it's just a, a transference of energy from one object to another. So when I shake, when I vibrate that spring, like you, you did in the lab, it was online yesterday. When you vibrate that, uh, the energy is, it's moving down, right? Moving through the spring. Now, in order for you to have a mechanical wave, and that's what we're going to talk about in this unit, um, you have to have something to move. All right? So that's something. That's something that gets moved is called a medium. So that's our first big vocabulary word of the day. The medium is what the wave travels in. Okay? The medium is what the wave is moving around. So think about an ocean wave. Well, it has to move water, right? Um, sound waves, like you're hearing me right now, those sound waves are moving air molecules, okay? Um, we can have seismic waves. We're gonna ignore this one for, for right now because we're gonna talk about electromagnetic waves next unit. Um, for seismic waves, those are earthquake waves. They have to move the earth. Right? So there has to be something for the wave to move. That something is called a medium. 
So the medium is what the wave is traveling through, what the wave that, you know, the particles of that are being moved around by the wave. Simple so far, right? If you don't have a medium, if you don't have anything to move around, then the wave can't travel. You can't have an ocean wave without water. I mean, that might seem a little silly, right? But there are other waves that uh, there's a lot of people, for example, who might think that if you were in outer space and you could somehow survive without your helmet, right? Uh, and you took off your helmet and you're yelling to your friend, will your friend hear you? The answer to that, you guys, a lot of people are giving me blank stares, but I saw some people shaking their heads, right? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the movie Alien. It's a good 80s horror movie. The, the little thing pops out of the guy's chest in it, okay? Um, on the movie poster for that movie, uh, the tagline was, in space, no one can hear you scream. Because if you're in outer space, in the vacuum of space, there can't be a sound wave. Why? Because in outer space, is there any part? are there any particles around you that can move? There's not, right? You can't breathe in outer space because there's no air. There's nothing there. And so there's no possible way for a, a mechanical wave to travel in outer space. So, you know, you watch those Star Wars movies and they, they blow up a ship in outer space or, you know, they fire their guns and you can hear the pew, 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 right? Like, uh, what would you really hear in real life? You would hear nothing. Because when that ship blows up, this, there's, no, there's nothing to, sh to vibrate to send out a, so a sound wave. So there will be no uh, sound from the explosion. There's no sound from the laser. Now, astronauts in outer space can talk to each other. Why? So I guess I'll pick on somebody. Um, Giovanni, why can astronauts in outer space talk to each other? Like I'm walking around on the moon. I'm Neil Armstrong. Giovanni, are you there? Okay, so they have a radio. And then Camilla, Camilla said the suits too. Um, so they do have a radio inside their suits. And they're not... The sound waves aren't traveling through the air. They have air inside their suit, right? And so the radio, they have a little speaker. And that speaker is transmitting the sound. And you guys, radio waves, that's why I said we'll get back to this. This shouldn't have been on that slide, actually. Well, uh, because radio waves are a special kind of wave called an electromagnetic wave. They're light waves, basically. Okay, so once again, mechanical wave, it has to have a medium. The medium is the thing that the wave is moving around. Okay, now there's two different types of waves. Two main types of mechanical waves. And the first one is a transverse wave. So in a transverse wave, you can see that the direction of travel of the energy is perpendicular to the motion of the actual particles. So the individual particles here are moving up and down, but the wave is moving forward. So when you think of a wave, when most of us think of wave, this is the kind of wave we think of as a transverse wave. All right. Um, and a really good example of that would be like a stadium wave. If you've ever been to a, a game, especially when the game gets boring and there's lots of people not paying attention, then all of a sudden people start standing up, putting up their arms and sitting down, right? Um, and then that, that wave travels around the stadium. Have you guys seen this in real life or on TV, right? Okay. Um, so this is, once again, transverse wave. Uh, ocean waves are like this. Um, Light waves, but we're not going to talk about light waves yet. <laughs> so this this would be the traditional wave, quote unquote wave that you guys are are used to. All right. Now, if you look at a transverse wave, so this is a transverse wave. Let me ask you this: Do the particles are the particles that are moving in the medium 
do they end up traveling forward with the wave? So, so yeah, I, I already see some people shaking their heads no. Um, you know, when I was your age, I, I used to think that, like, if I was standing on the edge of the ocean and a wave came in, that that water, like, came from the middle of the ocean and traveled on the wave. That's not what happens, okay? Um, what happens is, if I'm an individual piece of water, I just move up and down, up and down. I don't move forward. Only the energy moves forward. So for these transverse waves, the medium, you guys, only vibrates, only vibrates in the vertical direction, and then the energy travels in the horizontal direction. So the particle doesn't travel with the wave. It only vibrates up and down. Now, on the very, very edges of the ocean, um, because there's a lot of interference, and we're going to talk about that, um, the particles can move back and forth on the very edge. But if you're out in the deep ocean uh, and you see a buoy, like a navigational buoy, um, those buoys just move up and down, up and down. They stay pretty much in one spot. You don't, even if you don't chain them down, they just stay there. Okay. Um, so don't don't forget that the the individual particles in the medium don't actually travel forward with the energy. They just vibrate up and down. And that's true for all waves. So think about a sound wave, you guys. If the particles actually travel forward, um, in order to make a sound with your voice, you have you have to talk, right? You have to make you have to force air out of your mouth, right? Does the air from your mouth does that travel forward with the wave and go into somebody else's ear? Because if it did, then any time you talked and someone could hear you, they would be smelling your breath, right? That would be pretty horrible. I'll just tell you that right now. It would be pretty horrible. You would be able to smell what everybody ate and everything. Like, but that doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen because the, the particles from your mouth don't end up traveling along with the wave. The air molecules just vibrate back and forth. And it's just like really, really close to your mouth that they actually get pushed out. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the parts of the wave. Now remember, we already talked about this, that in a transverse wave, direction of disturbance up and down, uh, that would be vertical. And the direction of travel is side to side, that would be horizontal, right? So those are perpendicular to each other. Now, um, let's, we need to talk through some vocabulary, okay? So let's talk through wavelength first. These are the ones we need to talk about. Uh, so we have trough, amplitude, wavelength, and uh, crest. So these are our words that we're going to talk about. So let's do wavelength first. The wavelength is the length of one wave. And we talked about this yesterday. Okay, um, One wave is represented by one complete cycle. So if the uh, where the wave made a particle move up, back to the rest line, where it made it move it down, back to the rest line, back to where it's making it move up, okay? So that is the wavelength. Now the symbol for wavelength, you guys, is the Greek letter lambda. And that's what it looks like. So lambda, let me draw it bigger. That is the Greek letter lambda. When we write that in an equation, and you'll see it in your book, you'll see it online, this stands for wavelength. Okay, and that is, once again, the length of one wave. You can, you can measure it peak to peak or crest to crest. Okay? So the top part of the wave, that is called the crest or the peak. Um, I actually can't remember which one your book uses. So books use either, oops, that does not look like I wrote peak. Looks like I wrote peak from uh, like peekaboo. So the peak is P-E-A-K. So this is either called the crest or the peak. 
and that's the topmost disturbance. And the bottommost disturbance, you guys, is called the trough. Um, so you could also measure wavelength from trough to trough. Remember I told you yesterday, don't measure it from the rest line because you'll be very, very likely to only get half of the wave, right? This only represents the length of half of the wave. The wave has to go up, back to the rest line, down, back to the rest line. So this would be the whole wave, okay? So uh, if you go peak to peak or trough to trough, it's much easier to figure out. Now the amplitude, you guys, and uh, you saw this yesterday in your lab too. The amplitude is the height of the wave. So from, from the rest line to the peak, that would be the amplitude. The other way to measure it is from the rest line to the trough, okay? So from where the particle started to its maximum disturbance, and that could either be its maximum disturbance above where it started or below where it started. Okay. So amplitude is that height. The trough is the lowest part. The crest or the peak is the highest part. The wavelength is the length of one wave. Are we good so far? Can I move on? Yeah. Okay. Now there's a second type of wave, mechanical wave. Um, that's called a longitudinal wave. Now, a longitudinal wave, the disturbance is actually parallel to the motion of the wave. This is how sound waves work. So sound waves, you guys, are longitudinal waves. These waves are also called, just because everything in this unit has to have like more than one name, I think. These waves are also called compression waves. And you can see why they're called compression waves, because there are places where things get squeezed together. But once again, so in this longitudinal wave, you're kind of, you're pushing on the particles, you're squeezing them, and you're pushing them forward. Now, when you, like when you guys make a sound, when you talk with your voice, um, I don't know if you know this and we're going to get back to this, but do you know like what's happening to make that sound emanate from your, you know, from your throat into your mouth and out? I know, I know you, everybody's heard the term vocal cords before, right? Okay. Um, so you guys, you have two flaps of skin and they push, they push together. Um, and when they push, they compress the air and you can actually feel it. So right now, this is what I want you guys to do for me. Take, nobody's in your room with you. Well, maybe, but put your hand on your throat and just say something like la, 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 sing. It's fun to sing. I saw that in Elf. He likes to sing, right? So you can feel, you can feel the vibrations, right? It's squeezing, what's happening is it's squeezing the air together. So those vibrations, vibrations, you guys, are the source of wave motion, all right? And those, the, that squeezing together is causing that disturbance in the air. Um, it's causing that sound wave. Okay, now wait, I don't know if I put this on the next slide. Yes, I did, okay. so. Uh, compression waves or longitudinal waves, you guys, they have all the same quote unquote things as a, uh, as a uh, transverse wave, okay? So I could measure the length of the wave. The length of the wave would be from the compression to the next compression. So where we call this the crest or the peak, um, this is, on a longitudinal wave, this is called a compression, where the particles are squeezed together the most. 
So if I measure from compression to compression, that would be the length of one wave, okay? Now, where, where this was called the trough, on a transverse wave, on a longitudinal wave, this is gonna be called a rarefaction. So that's just, that's just equivalent to the trough. That's where the particles are pulled apart the most. So in a sound wave, you guys saw what happens is the particle moves to get squeezed and then it moves so that everything is pulled apart and then it returns to its original position. So the compression equivalent to the crest, refraction equivalent to the trough. Okay, and then we still have, you know, the length of a wave. The amplitude of the wave would be, um, would actually be the amount of compression or the amount of rarefaction. So in a sound wave, you guys, and once again, we'll talk about this later, the amplitude or the amount of compression is, uh, we measure that in decibels. Decibels is the volume of the sound. So if a sound wave, if a sound wave is actually a compression wave, um, you know, why do we think of waves like this, even sound waves? Like, have you ever seen, have you ever seen like on a screen and they're trying to represent a sound wave? Don't the sound waves on like computer screens look like this? I mean, they do, they do look like this, right? But basically what, what we do is uh, this down here is hard for, for our brains to, to comprehend, right? And so we have uh, equipment that translates this compression into a crest and translates this rarefaction into a trough. And so that this is easier for our minds to comprehend. It's easier for us. So we visualize Usually we visualize these longitudinal waves on computer screens like this. So if you've ever seen an oscilloscope, if you've ever seen like uh, something like that for sound waves, a lot of, I've seen screensavers, a lot of screensavers uh, uh, while you're playing music and they pop on, they'll show you that, you know, the, the oscilloscope version of the songs you're listening to, right? And that's how that's happening. All right, now, Here's some more vocabulary. We just have to get kind of through this vocabulary today, you guys. So the period, the period is the amount of time that it takes for one wave. So the period is the amount of time it takes for one cycle. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but there's a reason why uh, they call the menstrual cycle a period, right? because that's basically the amount of time for one cycle. So that actually, that is a physics term, you guys, that got co-opted, right? Um, then we have frequency. Frequency is the number of waves per second. Now I told you yesterday that's measured in Hertz. All that hertz means is cycles per second. So if you look at your radio, your radio has KHC and MHC. So AM radio is measured in kilohertz. Like if you're listening to WGN, that would be 720 cycles per 720,000 cycles per second. That's how many waves are being produced per second. Or if you're listening to uh, XRT, right, on the FM dial, That's nine, that would be 93,100,000 waves per second because it would be 93.1 megahertz, all right, cycles per second. Now, frequency and period are inverses of each other. So the frequency is equal to 1 over the period, and the period is equal to 1 over the frequency. Now, period, you guys... Our shorthand for it is a capital T, not a small t. So a small t is time. 
a capital T is the period. So the time for one cycle is equal to one over the cycles per second, or the cycles per second is equal to one over how long it takes for one cycle. Now this is something that we already would have talked about in a normal year, okay? We skipped, we skipped a unit called circular motion. Remember we did linear motion that was motion in a straight line that was where we started the year, right? Um, and then normally we also do circular motion that's motion in a circle. We would have talked about this at length, um, but you know, we had to cut some stuff out this year, right? So that was one of the things we cut. Uh, what does the F mean on the equation? Oh, so F is frequency. Oh, okay, and then the I, what does that mean? That's a one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so one over the frequency, one over the period. I'm sorry, you guys. It's my bad writing. So the, the most important one here, you guys, is frequency, okay? Um, and you, we're gonna, you're gonna see that in a second. So frequency, number of waves per second, all right? So does everyone have that written down? I'm looking at you guys. Give me a thumbs up, a nod yes, yeah? All right, okay, so here's why this is important. Let's, oops, let's go into our pivot lab from yesterday uh, real quick here. That is not what I want. Okay. All right, so, um, I just, I want to show you something, and this is, even when we do this um, in class, and you get to actually hold this slinky, all right, people still uh, have trouble with this. So I'm going to set this where the frequency is one, uh, it doesn't matter what the amplitude is, and I'm going to play this wave. So do you guys see, like, can you get a sense of the speed of that wave? We could measure the distance and the time, but you can kind of get a sense for the speed of that wave, right? Now, that frequency is one, which means it makes one wave every second. If I wanted to make more waves, I would just have to move it faster, right? If it was my hand, I would just have to move my hand faster. So if I set the frequency to three, let's say, all right, and we'll load that. And I'll, so that, that's gonna move three times faster gonna make three waves in one second does it seem like those waves are traveling any faster across the screen because it, it doesn't seem like that to me right um, if I make five waves every second and I send that wave across the screen it still doesn't seem like they're moving at a different speed right um, did anybody figure out how do I change the speed of this wave? Well, what if I change the tension in the spring? So by changing the tension, I'm pulling the spring tighter, okay? Now, if I, if I make five waves here, Those waves seem like they did move faster. In fact, they moved so fast that they came back. Did you guys notice that? Um, if I make the tension, so let me just play that again. Well, actually, let me just play one wave, all right? Let's load this. So we can kind of see the speed. That's one wave per second. Well, that's actually kind of deceptive. But the, the, the bigger the tension, the faster these waves move across. And the smaller the tension, 
the slower these waves move. Okay, so changing the frequency actually doesn't change the speed of the wave. Changing the amplitude doesn't change the speed of the wave, only changing the stretch and the slinky. Okay, so only the tension. And, um, you know, and some people, at least one person knew that because they messaged me. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you this equation, you guys. But I wanted to show you that before I give you this equation. So the velocity of a wave is equal to its frequency. F is frequency times its wavelength. Remember, lambda is wavelength. So the velocity is equal to the frequency. I don't know why this is having such a hard time writing today. My writing is bad enough normally. Now it's really bad. Uh, so the velocity is equal to the frequency of the wave times the length of the wave. Now, so if I double the frequency, I need, every, you know, so everybody think about this. Think about this in your head. If I double the frequency, what's going to happen to the velocity? All right. So, um, so Joaquin, what's going to happen? I double the frequency. What happens to velocity? Are you there, Joaquin? Okay. So the velocity doubles, right? That's what everybody thinks, but I didn't, we, I just got done showing you that if I change the frequency, it doesn't change the speed, right? Like we did that with the slinky. It when we're in class, like I I have everybody gather around it and we count it out, and um, like the frequency doesn't change the velocity. So if I double the frequency, I'll give you a hint: nothing happens to the velocity. Velocity doesn't change. All right. What has to change then? If I double the frequency, what has to happen? Anyone? If the velocity doesn't change, you guys, so velocity has to stay the same. If the frequency gets bigger, how do I have to keep that answer? What do I have to do to keep that answer the same? Okay, yeah, so the length has to change, right? And instead of the length getting bigger, if I make the frequency bigger, the length actually has to get smaller, all right? And uh, if I make the frequency smaller, the wavelength has to get bigger. So frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. So let me show you something again. Let's go back to that sim. Um, so look at the, I'm gonna put, a frequency of five on here. All right. And I want you to look at how long the waves are. So it's loading. So the high frequency, do you see how short those waves were? Did you guys notice that? And then if I make the frequency small, then I bet the waves get longer. So do you see how much longer they get? So when the frequency is smaller, the waves get bigger. When the frequency is bigger, the waves get smaller. Okay. Um, but the velocity of the wave doesn't change. The only thing that changes the speed of the wave, and you should definitely know this, the only thing that changes the speed of the wave is the medium, which is the thing the wave is traveling in. So the medium changes the speed of the wave. Nothing else changes the speed. So I want you to think about this for a second. If frequency or wavelength actually change the velocity, right? Um, isn't sound is a wave, right? So there are sound waves. Uh, if any, if any of you have ever played in a band, right? Like symphonic band, jazz band, I don't know, orchestra, whatever it is. If anybody's ever played a musical instrument. 
do do the the high frequency do the high pitch notes travel at the same speed as the low pitch notes so if i'm playing the flute and i'm playing a high note on the flute do i have to wait to play my my note for a few seconds uh, so that when the tuba plays, right, our waves travel and meet at the same time because they're traveling at different speeds. Like that, that doesn't happen, does it? Does the bass player have to play his note before the guitar player so that when they travel out, right, they're, they're traveling at the same speed, aren't they? So and because they're traveling at the same speed, they reach your ear at the same time if they're played at the same time. So for, that's just another. That's just more proof that frequency and wavelength don't change the velocity. The only thing that changes the velocity is medium. All right. So uh, here's here's something else. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this. So sound waves travel faster when the medium is denser. So if I have a uh, uh, if I have air, you know, waves travel pretty fast. They don't travel instantaneously, right? So I'll, gi I'll give you an example of that. Like, I think you guys probably have figured out, you know, I like baseball. I like to go to the games. Uh, because I'm a teacher, I have to sit like way out in the bleachers, right? Uh, where the baseball players look like this small. And, but I'm still, I still can see them. I'm still watching them. And, I can see the player swing his bat. And then, like a second later, I hear the sound of the bat hitting the baseball. Can you guys think of another example where you can see something happen and then you hear it later? I know you guys can think of an example. Like, think of the summer. Think about crazy weather. Thunder. Yeah, thunder and lightning. Yes, thank you. So um, you can see the lightning before you hear the thunder. You, ev like everybody knows those were made, those sounds were made at the same time, right? So it takes time for the wave to travel to you. Um, and just so you guys know, the speed of sound in air is normally 330 meters per second. Now, and it seems instantaneous, but your brain, uh, and this is something that, you know, usually I talk a lot about. Your brain, you guys, this is the best supercomputer in the world. There's no, there's no computer, man-made computer that works as well as this, okay? Um, your brain is actually able to determine which ear the sound gets to first. So if if you have say um, if you have your dog and it's to your right and it's barking, you know it's to your right. I isn't that correct? So you can tell the direction of a sound because your brain can determine which ear that sound is hitting first. So you know whether it's in front of you, behind you, to the side, you know all that stuff. Um, when you're in water and a sound is made, you can't tell where it's coming from. You just can't. I don't know if you've ever uh, been in this situation. You know, I, I grew up in a place where uh, it's up north. There's lots of lakes called the Chain of Lakes. Um, and so we used to swim the lake a lot, but you had to be really, really careful because there were motorboats, you know, people skiing, all this stuff. And when your head is in the water, you can't tell where the boats are. So they may be right on top of you, they may be far away, they may be to your right, to your left, like you can't tell. So you actually have to swim with your head up, looking around. Uh, why? Because the speed of sound in water, you guys, is incredibly fast. Um, and, and the speed of sound only depends on the medium. Now, normally, oops. Uh, so we'll, we'll let's do this problem and then I'll talk about how to change the how to change the medium for sound. So uh, let's just do this problem really quick. I have a six hertz wave. Now what that means is that the frequency is six. I'm making six waves every second. 
Now the wave has a velocity of 30 meters per second. I want to know what is the wavelength of that wave. So in this problem, I would just do velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Okay. Um, so then if I plug in the numbers, the velocity is 30 and the frequency is six. How do I get rid of that six? Thank you, I would divide it. So that goes away and the wavelength ends up being five meters, 30 divided by six. If I double the wavelength, or I'm sorry, if I double the frequency to 12, then the wavelength would have only been two and a half. Doesn't change the velocity. Easy enough? Okay. And you guys, the problems, a lot of you are struggling with them. And it's mainly because on this test, only three people actually turned in that homework lottery assignment. You guys need to do those, right? That's not optional work. It's only optional if you want to fail. Right? So for sound waves, you guys, we're only going to deal with sound waves in air. Um, and the way, does anybody know, how would you change how the air behaves? Like the spacing of the molecules, how much they're wiggling around normally. I would change the what of the air. It starts with the T. No? Is there anybody in band in here? No? I didn't see any anybody nod yes. That's kind of crazy. All right, well, if you want to change the spacing of the air particles, you guys should change the temperature, okay? So the speed of sound is 330 meters per second plus 0.6 times the temp. And the temp has to be measured actually in degrees Celsius. So we're going to use metric. So for every degree Celsius, you go up above zero, the speed of sound gets six tenths of a meter per second faster. And every degree Celsius you get below zero, the speed of sound gets 0.6 meters per second slower. So the reason I asked if anybody was in band, especially marching band, in marching band, uh, they play in all kinds of different conditions. Like when it's really hot outside in the summer or really cold in the fall. Um, so they're, they're going from indoors where it's cooler in the summer. They're going from uh, indoors to outdoors. And when they walk out, their instruments play sharp. And when in the fall, it's warmer indoors, so that you tune up your instrument indoors, you go outside, and then your instrument plays sharp. And the reason that that happens is because the, the speed of the sound wave is actually changing depending on the temperature. So let's do a problem that has that equation, all right? So let's say I see lightning, and then I hear thunder one second later. How far away is the lightning? Now, I was always taught that you could count the seconds and each second would be a mile. Have you guys heard that? Yeah, I mean, I, I see some nods, yes. So let's test to see if that's actually true, all right? Um, oh, and we need, a, we need a temperature here. We don't have a temperature. I'm spacing out. Uh, so let's say that it's a hot summer day. Um, 
let's say the temperature is 90 degrees. Uh, so 90 degrees Celsius, that's 32 degrees. I'm, I'm sorry, 90 degrees Fahrenheit is 32 degrees Celsius. So we'll say the temperature is 32 degrees Celsius. Okay. So now we know we know two things. We know the temperature. Oops. And we know the time. One second. And I want to know the distance. So we'll actually have to use two equations to solve this, you guys. Um, the first equation, we're going to have to find out what the velocity of sound is. And we'll use that 330 plus 0.6 times the temp. And then after we find that out, then we're going to have to use V equals D over T. The very first equation we learned this year. Remember I told you we're going to use all of our equations all year. So the speed of sound is 330 plus 0.6 times 32. And if you put that in your calculator, 0 0.6 times 32, that should be 19.2. So this should be 349.2. Someone could check my math for me just to make sure I'm right. So 349.2 is what I got. Okay, I got confirmation. So now to find the distance, now we have to use velocity as distance divided by time. So we know the velocity is 349.2. We don't know the distance, and the time is one second. Now to get rid of the one, because it, it's being divided, you would just multiply it, right? And when you multiply anything by one, you just get the same answer. So it's 349 meters. When I times both sides by one second, that cancels, but it's the same, same, same. So just, you guys, 349 meters is not a mile. Remember if you're in track, 1,600 meters is a mile. This isn't even one time around the track, distance-wise. So if, if you saw lightning and you heard the thunder one second later, like you should be seeking cover. You should be running. That's a super dangerous situation. That means that that lightning is less than four football fields away from you. So we were, we were taught wrong. We were all taught wrong. It's not a mile.